What I'm about to tell you happened just over a year ago. My best friend advised me to come here and tell everything. Until now, I was still too traumatized, and I didn't feel ready to share this experience. But now I think it's the right time to do it. I need to contextualize it first. My name is Maxima, and I'm a student in Paris. Not too long ago, I moved into a 30 square meter studio on the top floor of a small building in the Paris suburbs. It's a two-room apartment, very ordinary. There are almost only families living in the building, and everything is going well. It's usually a very quiet building on a small street with little traffic, perfect for working in a quiet atmosphere. The location is ideal. In short, it was exactly what I needed. What I'm about to tell you only lasted one night. It happened on a Friday evening in April. I finish work around 9pm and sit down to watch a series to finish the evening. Everything goes well and around midnight I go to bed. That night I have insomnia, something I rarely do. Looking back, I still wonder if it was a premonition or just a coincidence. I don't know exactly what time I fell asleep. I woke up at about 2am with a strange feeling. Like those nights when you wake up feeling like you haven't slept a wink, when in fact you have. I turn around and see the trees in the park across the street through the window next to my bed, but soon realize that I should not be seeing those trees. My shutter should not be open. Here's a little detail which is important. The windows are ones with two leaves. You fold down the two leaves from the inside to close the shutters. I close them every night, and at that moment, it seems impossible that I forgot to do it the night before. For you, it may be just a detail, but personally, I know there's something wrong. I start to feel hot and sweaty. I get up and walk around the studio. Nothing. I open my window to fold the leaves down and go back to bed. This strange situation sticks in my head and I can't get back to sleep. I try and try, but I can't. It keeps running through my head again and again. After half an hour, I start to doze off, but I wake up immediately after hearing a thud. At this point, I don't know if it's my imagination or if it's real, but I barely have time to ask myself the question when I hear noises again that I quickly identify. They are footsteps. They come from the floor in the corridor. It only lasted a few moments and then the footsteps stopped. I know something is wrong. My studio is the only one on the top floor, so it can't be a neighbor. Someone is in the corridor outside my door at 2am. My heart is beating very fast, but I try to keep calm. I try not to make any noise and wait. But the minutes pass and nothing moves. No noise at all. I know that the person is still in the corridor because I would have heard him coming down if he had left. After ten minutes or so, the atmosphere is so heavy and the silence is so eerie that I decide to get up as quietly as possible. I tiptoe to my door, hoping to see something through the island. But when I am only a few centimeters away from the island, there is a knock on the door. I find myself frozen in the doorway, with someone on the other side, knocking in a very unusual way. It was as if he was knocking with his fingers, one by one, very quietly. After standing still for a few seconds, I gather my courage and look through the eyelet, but I see nothing. There's no light in the corridor, and I don't want to make any noise so as not to be spotted, but after a few moments, I hear a laugh. I can tell by the sound that it is the laughter of a fairly young man. It's not a simple giggle, as one might imagine in this situation, but a real laugh, bordering on slapstick, as if the man was laughing at me. I could feel all the vice and perversity in the laugh. It stopped after a few seconds, as quickly as it had appeared. At that very moment, 
I am stunned and paralyzed. When I regain my senses, I quickly move away from the door, once again trying to be as discreet as possible. I sit silently on a chair to think calmly, and in a split second, I realize the situation and understand what is happening. The man at my door knows I'm in the flat. He's the only one who opened my shutters from the outside. He saw me in my room. I'll remind you that the studio is on the top floor. By going through the roof, you can access the top of the shutter. This is risky as it requires bending over the void, but I know it can be done. I had done it myself to repair the shutter that had jammed a few weeks after I'd moved in. I didn't feel like calling the repairman and decided to fix it myself. By going through the roof and leaning very slightly over the window, it is very easy to access the top of the leaves from the outside. Still leaning over, you can see part of the room where my bed is. The man did the same to open the shutters. By opening the shutters, he was able to see my room and at the same time, me sleeping. I also remembered that the ladder to the roof was in the corridor on the top floor. That's where he went to get up there. All this thinking happens in a split second in my head. I start to shake and my heartbeat increases in intensity. I stop thinking, pick up my phone and rush to the bathroom where I lock myself in and I call the police. I explain the situation to the lady on the other end, and she reassures me that she will send a patrol. She asks me to stay in the toilet and wait for the police. She tells me that she will stay on the line with me until they arrive. The police car arrives in about 10 minutes, but when they get to the floor, they find nothing there. The man must have run off while I was on the phone in my bathroom at the other end of the studio so I didn't hear anything. On further investigation, the police discovered that the cupola leading to the roof of the building was still open, which confirmed my theory. The policeman told me that for the moment, they could do nothing, and invited me to come to the police station the next day to file a complaint. It was out of the question for me to end that night in my flat. I called my best friend who lives nearby, and went to spend the rest of the night at his place. The next day I went to file a complaint. An investigation is underway, but the police told me from the start that it would be very difficult to catch this man. It's been a while since the incident, and I'm slowly recovering from the shock. Many questions are tormenting me. Who was this man? Why did he come to my house and open my shutters? Was it just voyeurism? Or did he have other ideas in mind? And above all, what would have happened if I'd opened the door? Since then, I've been trying to wrap my head around the fact that I'll probably never get answers to these questions. I'm hesitating to move out, or at least leave for a few weeks to move on. It's very complicated from a psychological point of view. I will remember that night, in April. 2021 for the rest of my life. Reading all these Let's Not Meet stories reminded me of an experience my cousin and I had in 2003 or 2004. For context, we're both women, and at the time, I was 12 or 13 and my cousin was 16 or 17. It was a hot, humid summer day, and my aunt was having a small get-together at her house. My family went over in the afternoon. After a few hours, there was a lull in the action, and my cousin and I wanted to go for a walk and enjoy the air, as it was getting a bit cooler. We had no particular route in mind when we set off, but after about a mile, my cousin suggested we continue on to our other aunt's apartment, which was a neighborhood over, and check in on her. The idea didn't sit well with me, but she was older than me. She assured me it would be fine. We wanted to keep walking anyway, so why not, right? We walked for so long 
that the sun began setting as we crossed over a bridge that traversed a creek and brought us into a more urban neighborhood in which my aunt lived. We stopped to take a short break, admiring the water while we chatted. I remember seeing the orange and red deepen in the sky and the shadows of the trees along the bank lengthened and gently swayed. At this point I was getting a bit tired so I was happy when my cousin said we only had a few more blocks to go. We kept on a sidewalk that ran the length of the right side of a very wide road. As we kept going, we noticed on the left side of the road, there was a smaller one that branched off at about a 30 degree angle. Given the fading light, we could also make out the figure of a large framed person walking in our direction. He was about a thousand feet away when he saw us. He roared at the top of his lungs, Hey, hey. He flailed his arms to get our attention. Then, he pointed and hollered, You. My cousin and I were taken aback. I remember thinking why he would scream like that, even if he thought he knew us. The manner and tone of his yell was unsettling. It was about five seconds before our mix of surprise and concern quickly turned to pure fear as this man took off in an all-out sprint toward us. Now, 1,000 feet seemed decently far away, but he was coming at us like Usain Bolt, and he was closing the distance fast. Fortunately, my cousin snapped into flight mode, and we took off running as fast as we've ever ran in our lives. With all the adrenaline pumping through me, I barely felt my feet hit the ground with each spring forward. Even so, I was just barely keeping up with my cousin, so she grabbed my wrist and held it firmly as we ran, keeping me alongside her. The guy shouted once again as he chased us, and my cousin glanced back. I'll never forget the look of terror on her face. She must have had an extra rush of adrenaline, because she burst forward even faster my wrist in hand. We were flying. As we closed in on my aunt's place, I could hear the man's footsteps getting louder. I could tell from the sound that he wasn't directly behind us, but I prayed we'd manage to keep enough distance to turn right at the next block and get to my aunt's yard unscathed. Thankfully, the sun was almost fully set, and it was even darker than before so I knew it would be harder to see where we went once we turned off the main road. Within a few seconds, we were rounding the corner and slowing down to open my aunt's gate. She lived in a basement apartment on a corner lot, which had a yard that was fenced in all round by six-foot-tall wooden panels. As my cousin went through the gate and ran into the yard first, I was the one to close it. We'd been going so fast and had so much adrenaline, my first impulse was to slam it and run down the steps to the apartment. But my instinct told me that the noise might alert him to where we were. So I closed the gate as quietly and quickly as possible. I looked for a lock, but there was none. I ran to where my cousin was on the steps leading down to the door. We stood on the steps with our eyes just above ground level trying to keep as quiet as possible. A few seconds later, I heard the man's footsteps and saw him run to the cross street that flanked my aunt's yard. He stopped for a moment to look around, breathing hard and mumbling expletives. I held my breath as I saw his eyes in the top of his head swivel around wildly, searching for any sign of us. In a flash, he suddenly took off down the side street past the yard, and I breathed a sigh of relief. We knew we had to get indoors. We knocked on the door, being careful not to bang and draw attention, but there was no one. No one was home. My cousin began to look for a spare key that she may have hidden, while I tried to get the small window by the door open. No luck. At this point, we were trying not to panic, but it started to dawn on us the danger we were in, and the fact we didn't have any good options for safety getting inside or back home. It was dark now, 
We were both tired and knew we couldn't outrun him again if he doubled back and saw us. We didn't want to be sitting ducks, especially since the gate didn't have a lock and trying to run back was too risky given how far it was. Fortunately, my prayers were answered some minutes later when the neighbor's backyard light turned on and we heard barking. A couple was letting their small dogs out and they stood on their deck talking while the dogs ran around. My cousin and I crept over to the fence and could see through a few cracks in between the panels. We managed to get their attention and explained what had just happened. They were definitely surprised, but were also very nice and understanding. They must have heard the panic and desperation in our voices because they took us seriously. They offered to drive us home and we gratefully accepted. As they drove us back to my aunt's house, I remember being so glad that they went outside when they did. So for some quick backstory, I've had a stalker for about four years. He was never aggressive or sent me proper threats, so, stubborn as I am, I did my best to ignore him and not give him the satisfaction of showing him any fear. His stalking behavior mostly just consisted of sending me letters and gifts, such as photos of my own apartment building from the outside, things he dug out of my trash can, and so on. I called the police many times, but they weren't able to catch or identify him. About three weeks ago, I discovered the German version of Ask Me Anything on Reddit, and I thought that people might want to know about what it's like to have a stalker. Since I barely have any social media aside from Reddit, and have no personally identifying information here, I didn't think he'd ever see it. One person even asked me, does he know you're putting him on blast on Reddit? And I answered, maybe. Maybe it would make him angry. Maybe he'd be turned on. I don't know and don't care. Well, I know the real answer now. He did see it, and he did not like it. Like I said, he was never aggressive and never came close to me. The closest I know of was when he sent a picture of myself unlocking my apartment door, taken from the corner of the steps above. But I consider myself a pretty vigilant person, and I'm thinking that he might have hit a camera there instead of being there to take the photo himself. I think I would have noticed him if he did. I don't know how he got wind of the ask me anything, but he did. The next week was quiet, no letters, and I didn't see him anywhere. Then he left me letters with printed out questions and my answers from the ask me anything. He also left me a long hateful letter towards my boyfriend. It was about an issue I had posted on the German version of am I the asshole. His letters were never hateful like that before, though he never seemed happy with my boyfriend. He wrote about how I should share the spotlight with him since I got so much attention thanks to him. A few days later, I got a gift, but this time, he didn't leave it in my mailbox or at my car like he usually did. No, this time, he left it inside the apartment building, right in front of my door. I didn't take it inside my apartment, but I opened it outside. It was a pretty big box, which was also unusual, and it was taped shut. As I'm typing it out, I realize that it wasn't a good idea at all and it could have ended badly for me. Luckily, he didn't send me a bomb or anything. He did, however, send me several zip ties, a roll of tape, the kind you use to tape off walls when painting, nothing you could use to restrain someone, a TV remote with most buttons picked off, and a pack of band-aids with a few used ones. Well, they were just made to look that way, according to the police and there was also a framed picture of me. I could tell the picture was taken a few days ago, and my boyfriend was next to me, but he was cut out of the photo. The frame was shattered, and the package was full of glass shards, clearly more than what just could have fallen out of the frame, 
and they were also intentionally put inside the crumbled newspaper that was stuffed in there that was keeping it all in place. I called the police right away and gave it to them. They were more concerned this time, and they told me they'd send patrol cars more frequently. He didn't show up or leave me any letters or gifts for about another week and a half. But eight days ago, it started again. I found letters in my mailbox where he wrote about how he wasted his time on me, how I haven't been appreciating his effort, how he was wrong about me being special. Five days ago, I left my apartment in the morning and heard a crunch sound as I stepped on my doormat. He put broken glass under it in the night. I went off to work because I was in a hurry and was just going to make my boyfriend call the police. But then I found my car had also been vandalized. The sides were scratched, lights smashed, and the windshield had had a phrase painted on it. It said, it's time soon, Miss Acker. I went back inside and called the cops myself. They found the same phrase on a note under the doormat. This time they really, really took me seriously, which might have been because I was just pissed at this point, which I made very clear. If, for some reason, you're like me and just too stubborn to be afraid of a stalker like mine, then all of this... The letters, gifts, photos, even the damn glass under my doormat are just really annoying and inconvenient. But my car was useless to me now, and the threat scared even me. I did, however, have a dash cam in my car, and it caught everything. The police took the footage as evidence, and they told me they'd look into it further and promised to send more patrol cars. Then it was quiet for two more days, until two days ago. Someone rang the doorbell at just after 4am. My boyfriend and I got up, but we were both hesitant. But I saw blue lights outside, and just as I got up, I heard them shouting, This is the police. Please open the door. They told us that they were called by one of our downstairs neighbors, who came home from his night shift just an hour earlier. They heard someone else enter the building after them before the door fell shut. This neighbor then went into his own apartment and looked through the peephole. We have motion-activated lights in the stairway, so he waited to see if they turned back on. They did. Then he saw a middle-aged man walk up the stairs. Above this neighbor are only me and my boyfriend, and a single mom with three kids, who probably won't be getting any visitors at 3 a.m. So he called the police. They came and had found my stalker, one half floor above me on the stairs. He should have been able to see the cops since there's a little window up there, and they did have their lights on, but he either missed them or wanted to get caught. They found a pocket knife on him, and he confessed to being my stalker right away. He's finally caught. They got him. It took four years. A provocative Reddit post and one very vigilant and caring neighbor, but he's finally done. For now, at least. He's facing several charges, and I've collected every single piece of evidence over the past four years. I don't know what kind of outcome I can expect, but for now, I finally got some peace. Back in the summer of 2012, my friend and I had just left from a party across town. We were parked in front of my apartment complex. It's about 3 in the morning and we were bullshitting and talking about the party. We decided to smoke a bit of weed before heading into the apartment. I was in the passenger seat as I'd let my friend drive us home because he was less inebriated. Unfortunately, the car window on my side wasn't rolling down so I opened the door to let out some smoke as I smoked a cigarette. This caused the car's inside lights to be turned on, so my friend could load a bowl. We were parked next to the sidewalk, and the gate to get to my apartment was directly next to us. I see a man walking about 15 feet up the sidewalk come into my view. 
In my state, I have very little time to react, and I'm still propping the passenger side door open as he passes by. He and I make eye contact momentarily, as he can see the two of us due to the car's lights being on, and I get a chill down my spine. He looks almost goblin-like. He was about 5 foot 10, and he's wearing an oversized yellow hoodie and had a gaunt face. His cheeks were hollowed out, and his skin was leathery and tanned. It was like he may be on something. His head and chin, covered in patches of pubic-looking scraggly black hair, with blonde bleached highlights. He smiles to reveal what was left of some rotten yellow teeth. He seems to be walking quickly with a purpose, but suddenly stops by my door and asks, Is this my car? Then yells with a raspy tone, You stole my car. He then grabbed my door, leaving one hand in his pocket, clearly holding something. Startled, I slam the door on his hand and he screams, trying to still hold on to it. So I slam it again, and he quickly pulls his hand away and I lock the doors. He continues to shout expletives into my window, spitting on it, and even pressing his face against it as he does. I turn to see my friend, pale-faced and wide-eyed, fumbling to get the keys into the ignition as the man begins circling to the front of the car and then pulls out a bottle of what I assume is lighter fluid out of his pocket and starts spraying it all over the hood and the windshield. I look back over at my friend, and he still can't get the keys in the ignition. The man then pulls out a metal lighter, starts it as he laughs, and he screams, This is my car. In a moment of clarity, I manage to grab my friend's hand to guide the key into the ignition, and I say, drive. He then slams on the gas and peels out into a U-turn, and the man barely backs up enough to not be pinned into the car in front of us. As my shoulder gets thrown against the door, due to the sudden burst of speed. As we drive down the street, going 65 on a 25, I look back with tears welling up in my eyes, and vaguely see the man dancing around with his lighter in the middle of the street. We blow through red lights and stop signs and don't stop for about a half a mile. When we stop, I call my roommate. He walks out with a concealed firearm and says he can't see anyone. So we return and he escorts us back inside. It all happened in a split second and my friend remained quiet and pale-faced for about an hour after the incident. I made sure to park inside the apartment gates from then on. So back in January, my boyfriend and I celebrated our first anniversary. We went out to a really nice restaurant, got all dressed up, the works. I gifted him a jar full of 52 different pieces of paper with different things I loved about him. One for each week we'd been together. He brought this into the restaurant so we could read them while we waited for our food. People loved this. I guess most of the people in there were older and they thought we were adorable, so we kept having people send us free appetizers and such. At the table behind us, there was a large party clearly drunk and eating dinner. Most of them were around 50 or 60 with the exception being a very old lady with a walker, possibly the matriarch. Sitting at this table is an older man, who, halfway through our dinner, comes over to our table and sits down, and starts making conversation with us. He tells us that he and his wife finds us both attractive, and if we would like to join them for their after party. We can't tell if he's joking, as he points out the very old lady, and says she'll be partying with them as well. My boyfriend and I laugh politely, obviously, but really, we just want to have our dinner in peace. He then offers to buy us a bottle of champagne to celebrate our anniversary, which is when I break it to him that we're underage, but I thank him nonetheless. So instead, 
He insists on buying us a dessert and then goes back to his table. You would think it stopped there. When the desserts get delivered, the man comes back over to our table and sits down again. He once again asks us if we would like to join him and his wife at the after party, and we once again decline. He then stands up and starts asking us about our sex life, saying we're both very attractive and we must be going home to bang after the dinner. He then says something along the lines of, you're both so good looking, you would make beautiful babies. We laugh uncomfortably and say we're too young for that, and then he pulls out his wallet. He opens it up and pulls out one of the multiple hundred dollar bills that's in there, and then he says, I'll give you a hundred dollars to go home and make a baby right now. My boyfriend and I are flabbergasted and don't even know how to respond. I end up joking about how I would have a baby, but the boyfriend doesn't want one for a few more years. And the man winked at me and said, So, poke a hole in the condom. At this point I'm just staring at him, shocked. And I say, Sir, I'm 19. He laughs and says, And the Virgin Mary was 14. At that point, my boyfriend and I were looking at each other with shock, disdain, discomfort, and the man's wife or something comes over to collect him. She ushers him out the door as he makes some excuse about being drunk, as if that gives him a right to interrupt our anniversary dinner to ask us to party with him and his wife, and then grill us about our sex life. When I was a kid, I used to ride my bike around our hilly neighborhood, sometimes with friends, sometimes alone. This particular afternoon, I was alone, probably about eight or nine years old, and coasting down one of the big, long hills. I used to let my jacket fly out behind me like a cape. Good times. Suddenly, I was aware of a car driving on my left, slowing down. I'm not sure why I slowed to a stop. Perhaps the driver motioned as if they had a question. Of course, I had stranger danger training, so I was cautious and kept my distance from the car, one foot on the pedal, poised to go. It looked as if only one person was in the car, but I was worried that someone could be crouched down on the passenger side, waiting to jump out and grab me. The passenger window rolled down, and the driver, a woman with big hair, leaned toward me and called out. Hey there, do you want to go to the circus with me? I was immediately terrified. No. I took off down the hill, pedaling as fast as I could. The problem was that the bottom of the hill was just a court, and it was basically the end of the neighborhood, bordering a major highway. I would have to turn around and come back up the hill on this road, which looped back up from the court. This was a steep hill, and I feared I'd be a sitting duck for anyone to jump out of a car and grab me. I started strategizing. Should I go off-road into a yard? My friend's house is back where the car was. I didn't even look over my shoulder to see if the car was following me. I just pedaled like my life depended on it. My heart was pounding. I decided grass would slow me down more, and I stayed on the road until I got to my best friend's house, probably the longest 10-minute bike ride ever. I ran straight into the house like a wild child and told them all what happened. Funny, this was supposed to be a safe neighborhood, and no one locked their doors during the day. I don't think anyone called the police, but I never saw that car or its driver again. From that point on, I became hypervigilant and wary of putting myself in bad situations. Even if a bad situation meant riding down that big hill with the court at the bottom, I avoided it. Even to this day, when I'm on a walk or a jog, I make sure there are multiple escape routes on my path. As an adult, I've told this story to others who have been horrified, 
but the experience confirmed all the stranger danger warnings I'd received. I even thought it was normal. Recently, I looked up the statistics, and apparently it is actually rare for children to be kidnapped off the street by a random. Maybe the craziest part of this story is that as a younger child, my one recurring nightmare was of a circus on fire. I was already scared of the circus, and a stranger tried to lure me into their car with it. This happened in January 2017. I was going to visit my boyfriend at his flat, so I got the train across to his town. It's important to note I was traveling with my pet dog, a five-year-old border collie. I was traveling at peak time around 5.30pm, so it was fairly busy. When getting off the train, there was the usual rush and push for people to climb the stairs across the platform and leave the train station. I don't know what made me notice him, but there was this guy directly behind me when I first got off the train. Mid-thirties, smart casual dress, just an ordinary looking guy, but something made me notice him. As it was so busy, it took me a few minutes to climb the stairs, cross the bridge across the train platform, and down the other stairs. During this, I noticed this guy two more times once walking very near me, the next directly in front of me, and then he disappeared. As I go through the ticket barrier and left the train station, I then started to cross the car park, which had already cleared quite a bit. Suddenly this guy is in front of me again, but he's stopping me in my tracks, trying to talk to me. He's smiling at me and he says, I noticed your dog was limping. Wanna hop in the car and I'll give you a lift? I've got a dog, and I know how it feels when they're not well. At this point, I remember just looking down at my dog in confusion, because she wasn't limping and wasn't sick. I started to get this horrible gut feeling, and I just said to him, She's fine, thanks. I'll just walk home. It's not that far. I then started to walk away from him, and he deliberately sidestepped to block my way before saying, No, honestly... It's fine. Just get in the car. I again told him no and tried to walk away. I could feel my dog start to tense up, and I tried to act really calm and nonchalant, but I was so scared of this guy. I'm so glad I had my dog with me, though. At least I had some sort of protection. Again, he blocks my path and says, What's your problem? Just get in the car. I'm helping you out. At this point, I don't even reply to him. I push past him and speed walk away. The path I take runs parallel to the car, and he's just standing there, watching me before getting in his car. I'm total paranoid about walking now, in case he's following me in his car, so I deliberately linger on a main road, where there's nowhere for traffic to stop, before running to my boyfriend's house. My memory is fuzzy, but this story frightened me so much that I can't ever forget it, and it comes to my mind every now and then. I was five or six, living with my parents and older sister and brother. My sister is 16 years older than I am, and one day my parents and brother weren't home. My sister went to go take a shower. She told me to stand in front of the bathroom door and play, because she didn't want me to be completely alone. The bathroom door was in the same hallway as our front door. The entrance was at a diagonal, and the opening of the door faced the bathroom. The door was locked. My sister had double-checked. We also had that little chain thing up. As I was standing there, the doorknob started to shake, which immediately frightened me. And to my surprise, the door opened as much as it could with the chain on it. A man tried poking his head through the door. The memory of how he looked is what's unclear to me now. I can't be certain anymore, but I'm almost positive he was bald, and he was white with like a pink hue to his skin, almost as if he was sweltering hot 
and sweating or something. I don't remember seeing any sweat though. His face had no expression and he just pushed his face through the door as much as he could and looked at me. He didn't say a word. I was frozen and staring back at him. I was so scared that I couldn't move. I'm not sure how long this lasted. I feel like he could have put his hand through and flipped the chain to come in if he wanted to, but he just kept staring. He stuck his hand through the door, but just gripped the edge of the door, and I remember his knuckles turning pink from his tight grip. At some point I turned to the bathroom door and screamed and pounded on the door for my sister to come out. She of course did so as fast as she could, and the man closed the door and left. My sister vaguely remembers this, but she didn't see anyone when she looked out the window. I don't know what that was, but it was creepy as hell, and it is one of a couple creepy memories that I have from that house. This happened. Wow, almost 10 years ago now. I was 19 and attending junior college in my hometown. I lived with my grandparents on the outskirts, so mostly field around us. Not really an area you can walk place to place in. Anyway, I come home from class one day and no one else is home. It's about 3 in the afternoon and there's a knock at the door. I open the door but leave the screen door closed as I don't know the man. He's older than me, wearing khakis, a button-down, and a tie. But the kicker is, they're dirty. He looks very disheveled. He has no car that I can see from my door. He first tries to act like some kind of salesman, asks me if that's my car in the drive. Is that my dog? Mostly about stuff he noticed. I should have just shut the door on him, but I was too nervous to think straight. He asks when my parents will be home. At this point, I'm freaking out and tell him I need to go. He gets more persistent and asks to come into the house to just throw something away and shows me this little plastic fruit cup. I say, no, I don't know who you are. He tells me a name, probably a fake name, and I say, no, I'm sorry, I don't know you. I need to close the door. Before he leaves, he asks if I will come out and hug him. I shut the door, locked it, made sure the doors and windows were locked, and called my then boyfriend. My grandparents came home and I told them what happened. A few minutes later, the guy was back. When my grandparents answered this time, he left. Later that night, the cops were going door to door in the area. They came to us too, looking for him. I still berate myself for not shutting the door sooner. I don't think I could wrap my head around what was happening, or possibly about to happen to me at the time. I don't ever open the door for people I don't know, if I'm not expecting a delivery or something like that. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. If you can't get enough Mr. Revenant content, check out the perks of my Patreon and channel membership. Details are in the description. I want to say a special thanks to those already supporting the channel. So huge thanks to... Chelsea, Dez, Tina, B, Snowball Rathina, Amanda Jane, Paula, Dina, Vabby Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Art and Gaming, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, Crafty Kel, Kay, Borderline Betty, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Sam, Zepp, Mr. Backwards, Sarah C, Casey, Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, 
Lil Smart, Jennifer, Gabrielle, Misanthropia, Ryan, Estara Ring, Rudy, Rochelle, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Fire 05, Jody, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. Thank you all for listening, guys. I'll see you in the next one.